Right. Hey, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be offended. <laughs> um, we do this show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's not a problem. We have all our recordings on our website, so you can go back and watch them all there. And we do a mixture of things here on the show, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, demos. Um, basically, if it's uh, library related, we want to have it on the show and share it with everyone. Um, we do. We have uh, commission staff, Nebraska Library Commission staff, that do presentations, and we have guest speakers. And this morning is one of our regular mixtures of that, I guess we'll call it. <laughs> um, once a month, usually the last Wednesday of the month, we do Tech Talk um, with Michael Sowers, who is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning. He's here next to me. And he tells you the tech news of since things that have happened since last month and has um, brings in <laughs> guests and speakers, which he has today. And I will just uh, hand over to you, Michael, to Great. share what we're going to have on the show this yeah, morning. Thanks, Krista. Yeah, if, if we were in print, this would be called a column, I guess. You uh, yeah, know, But yeah, I'm not sure uh, what you call it with... With the show, we'll have to think about that, maybe come up with a new word. Uh, so good morning, as Krista said, I'm Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at Nebraska Library Commission. And uh, today uh, we have with us Brian Pitchman of the Evolve Project. Brian, you on the line? Yes, I am. Great. Uh, welcome back. Uh, you were back on, I think, back in like 2012. It's, it's been quite a while. And, it's been a while, um, yes. Yeah, so... Um, Brian recently attended CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, which I am regularly uh, jealous of. I, I got to attend back in the um, late 90s when I was uh, actually living in Las Vegas. It's, it is quite an event. Um, but Brian, as I understand, also kind of went not only to see what the new gadgets were, but kind of went with a bit of an intention in promoting libraries. Would that be a correct uh, description? Yeah. That's All very right. correct. All right, so uh, Brian, uh, you've got your presentation up there. We can see that. Why don't you just go ahead and, and tell us about your experience at CES this year? Yeah, sure. So, so to begin, for those that aren't sure what CES is, it stands for the Consumer Electronics Show. Um, they say it's not open to the public, meaning like not anyone can just walk in and attend. There's like a whole registration process. You have to approve your affiliation, whether if you're press or within the technology industry. Um, but I'm working to change that up just a little bit, and we'll get to that later. Um, and then they typically do it the, sec the first full week of January. So this year it was the 7th through the 10th. Uh, but if you were pressed, you would be able to get there on Sunday the 5th and kind of do some like pre-conference events. Um, and what they do at CES, it's, it's split between conferences and keynotes and just exhibit after exhibit after exhibit. Um, most of these exhibits are announcing new products or something new that you can play with hands-on experience. So it's a really good good way to meet um, like owners of companies. I met the CEO of or the former CEO of Leapfrog. I met Randy Zuckerberg, uh, the sister of Mark Zuckerberg, who created Facebook. Um, and so, and all these people are super friendly and really easy to approach, uh, which I was very surprised about because uh, I figured you know they'd be you know too high up there and don't really want to interact with people. They want to do their thing and get out. Um, so I was very surprised that was not the case. Um, and then during all these keynotes, there's also more uh, product releases, special special announcements. Um, and so with that being said, there's there's about, there's about over 3,200 different exhibitors and 150,000 industry professionals attend the show um, every year. And that includes international people. And within this space, it's about 2 million square feet. Um, so if you're trying to wrap your head around what does 2 million square feet look like, it's about 35 football fields. So if you can imagine that, that's huge um, and with different size exhibits and different size booths, all talking about technology or some new cool innovative product. Uh, so I wore a Fitbit just for giggles to see how far I walked. Um, so Tuesday was a travel day for me, but then Wednesday I was mostly in um, conference halls. So between conference halls, I walked just over five, just over five miles. But on Thursday is when I attended most of the exhibits, and I walked over, you know, 12.5 miles within that within that arena, which is I don't know to me that was a lot. I felt dead afterwards, and then Friday I kind of wrapped up and visited a few more people. So 
if you can kind of, if you want to see what a, uh, from a scale perspective, here's the Samsung uh, exhibit, which is from here, from this corner, all the way down to that corner. And so, with, and then inside of that exhibit is all their products, like their TVs, their cameras, their phones, that they just have lying, lying around. You pick it up, you can play with it. They have Samsung reps there, um, and a lot of paid models essentially selling the gear. Um, so. Samsung, for instance, was either looking for more distributors or people to sell their products to or talking to press to promote their products. So what's it take to attend? For me, overall cost was just under $1,000, and that included the hotel and the flight. To get in, it's technically free if you register early. And there's all these, I was lucky enough that I met the right people while I was there, so I heard about like the free shuttles between the hotels and the conference halls. So I didn't have to pay for a taxi. Then I heard about a, a round trip shuttle from the airport to a hotel. It's like 14 bucks, so seven each way. Um, so there's lots of really cool ways to save money while you're there. And then in terms of food, uh, depending on which events you go to, there's a ton of events at night. Uh, Spotify hosted a, a party with free food and uh, free drinks, and all these other companies are always hosting evening parties. So you got your dinner plans, and if you go for uh, a conference or a keynote in the morning, they usually have some type of breakfast thing. So what did I, what did I bring? Um, I brought a real nice camera to take pictures. Um, if you were curious, as you see the photos, it's a Samsung NX300 with a low light lens and uh, a power brick for your phone because my phone died like halfway through the middle of the day because the reception isn't the greatest and I'm also taking pictures and tweeting. So bring one of those like power USB power, power bricks, they're really small and light. Um, bring good shoes. I made the mistake of not bringing good shoes. I wore dress shoes so I can look kind of classy and uh, they were they were destroyed by the end of it from all the walking. So uh, bring like gym shoes. Uh, and then people, what do people wear when they're there? It ranges from people in jeans and t-shirts uh, all the way up to like full suits and ties. And so if you wanted to attend, uh, I would encourage you to wear like uh, jeans and like a sports coat or something. Look, look clean and presentable at the very least. Um, as you're talking to people. So here's a couple more photos to kind of show you the size and the grandeur of CES. So people spend a ton of money on their booths. For instance, uh, TCL, this little diamond prison that you see on the right, is it just houses three TVs inside uh, promoting their 4K TV and their 3D TV. Uh, audio companies, they hire DJs and they DJ and play music the entire time they're there. So as you go through their booth, you can hear their music on their speakers. Here's Panasonic's booth. Again, really nice. It looks like they're supposed to be there, like their storefronts. And uh, I wanted to ask what they did with all this material when they were all done. Like, did they chuck it or did they store it somewhere? Because it looks very expensive. So SES, there's two main venues. There's a convention center, which most people hang out at which shows all the exhibits, most of the exhibits, I should say, um, and every mainstream company like Samsung, LG. Um, Apple actually does not attend CES anymore. I don't know the story behind that. Uh, and then Whirlpool and, and other companies like that are in the main convention center. This is also where all the conferences and workshops are hosted. Uh, between the convention center and the Venetian, the convention center was super crowded because there was a lot of those fanboys or fangirls uh, everyone that loves LG, for instance, was basically stayed at the LG booth the entire time. Like, I literally was there the next day, and I saw the same people standing around, like, the gear and just staring. Um, why? I'm not sure. Uh, I've never had that fanboy feel. Uh, and then these in the convention center are very more, are much more expensive and very elaborate displays. Uh, the Venetian on the other side is, is focused for, more around startup companies or companies that are trying to find funding or companies that are trying to find distribution channels. So the Venetian for me, and I think for you guys too, if you were going to attend CES, uh, hang out at the Venetian because these are those people are really easy to approach. They have you know booth size, um, what you're familiar with, and like a like at ALA those normal booth sizes essentially is what they use, and you just walk up and down, you chat, and uh, I think uh, success is when talking to because I was bringing libraries up to these different groups. So at the Venetian, it was much easier because people were willing to sit down and chat. And we're going to get into that in a little bit, too. But 
between and then the Venetian also lets you do a lot more hands-on. So like they'll you can sit down and program with something and play with it. Whereas when you're in the convention center, it's so crowded. There's lines if you wanted to demo anything. So why would a library go? That's a great question. So I'm going to backpedal here and show a stat from uh, Lee Rain uh, from Q Research. What I want you guys to pay attention is the difference between people that use the library in the last 12 months and the people that say libraries are important to the community. So it's a 38% difference. So I apply that, that figure to the exhibitors. So basically, I knew that 1,600, or almost 1,700 exhibitors were in the library in the last 12 months, and almost 3,000 exhibitors know that libraries are important. With that being said, I went up to each exhibitor that I thought had a cool product or I wanted to work with them and bring their technology into libraries. I would ask one of these basic questions like, have you considered libraries in your marketing plan? Or have you considered selling to libraries? Do you value libraries? And these simple questions, it was really interesting watching people react because that was not a question they've ever been asked before. Um, you know, have you, could you see your product in libraries? I went up to uh, one company who makes tablets for kids and I said, hey, have you guys considered selling your stuff to libraries and they were like well no because libraries are for books and I, you know, I had to take a step back and go hey you know what that's changing though they're doing more innovative things they're building maker spaces and pulling in lots of uh, uh, digital petting zoos and things like that and so they were like well yeah our product is really cool it's locked down and you know we can we can work out library pricing so these people were really approachable with that idea that libraries don't have the uh, funds to purchase, you know, big, large equipment, so there has to be some type of price negotiation. They were already gung-ho about it. And the second thing I thought was really cool was that some companies wanted to use libraries as a beta test ground. I was in a uh, section called Kids at Play where they were talking about how startup companies struggle with doing their beta testing and how they have to pay all this money to do, do beta testing. So uh, I asked, I said, have you guys considered using libraries to beta test your product? You give the product to the librarian, the librarian who is an expert at cataloging and metadata and, and things like that, can then uh, show the patrons how the product works, collect the data, and then give it back to you. The library wins because they get a product that no one else gets to play with, and you get a win because you don't have to pay for a beta testing company. And Hasbro was on, was on the panel, and they were, they were really surprised that they, they haven't thought about that session or thought about that relationship. And then a couple other companies were like, yeah, you know what, we should, we should look into doing that. So sidestepping, how does this apply to you right now? There's probably half a dozen companies within driving distance of you guys that are building some new cool product. Ask them if you can beta test their product in your library where you don't have to pay for it, but you collect the data for them. So I also brought a poster around that said, I love libraries. And as I was talking to people, I wanted them to take photos of the poster. Um, I actually became so engrossed with talking to different people, I totally forgot I had a poster. Um, so I didn't take as many photos as I would have liked. Uh, so on the left here is the CEO co-founder of Siftio Cubes, Little Interactive Cubes. And on the right, uh, Aya is her name, and she is the uh, CEO co-founder of Little Bits, Little Interactive uh, Circuit Boards. Uh, Sphero is another company I approached and we chatted. Uh, I've actually worked with them a lot a lot of times in the past. So it was really nice to actually meet the owner of the company and he took a photo with the poster. Um, a couple new companies, uh, Second Avenue, he was in the Eureka Park exhibit. So again, really simple. They're trying to get get, what, get uh, up to speed. They create learning environments, and a, literally a virtual environment for learning. So you can go onto a website and build physics, physics environments, like how does a ball roll down a hill? And you can build things in really easy and not really, don't even know how to use programming to do it. And so they sell specifically to schools because they do the grades, et cetera. So I talked about him. Hey, have you guys considered doing this as an online, online resource, online database, so the younger kids can have a place to play and build environments in to learn from? And he was like, ah, that's actually a really cool idea. Uh, modular Robotics is another one. They're in a few libraries, but when I asked them, hey, have you guys considered selling to libraries, they haven't really thought about that as their main market, uh, as a market source. And so what Modular Robotics does is they build things called cubelets, which are little, little cubes that have different sensors or different motors that either move, vibrate, light up, etc. And you can just connect them and you basically build simple robots. 
with no programming or wires. We also build something called a MOS, which is these guys. They're smaller cubes, um, no coding, no wires again, but there's more configuration opportunities between the, all the different cubes. So you can build a car, for instance, out of these little cubes, like a small car. Um, but these would be great for STEM learning, robotics learning, et cetera, that a lot of libraries are doing. Um, another really cool company is called Pinocchio. And so they build wireless web-enabled projects. Um, so they have this really itty-bitty circuit board, essentially, that is wirelessly connected to a network. And you can actually have it plugged into, they were saying, what was it, like lamps and lights and things like that and have things turn on, turn off. And it's really simple programming. So kind of that home automation idea. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other, it's for prototyping. So if you wanted to create something new but you weren't sure where to start, this gives you that opportunity. There's another company called Tai Chi, which makes a like almost an artificial intelligence robot for on your phone. So it's an app, and you can stick it into a car, and these cars can communicate with other cars, and um, you can communicate with them. They recognize human faces and human reactions. Um, so that was really really cool, and I think libraries can play around with that. Um, this might be a little different. Uh, this was called Beams, and what they make was a little. Uh, so an infrared DJ mixing board almost. And by moving your hands between the infrared lights, you can make different sounds. Um, so a lot of some libraries are making that music play space or make, let's make music in your library. Um, this was a really inexpensive project to do that, and it was a lot of fun. So I approached them about libraries. Have you guys considered libraries? Because libraries are doing music stuff. And they were like, that's actually a great idea. And then 3D printing companies. I even approached a few 3D printing companies. Some were very unsuccessful, and some were very successful. Like this one was extremely successful. Um, they have a 3D printer for $800 that I would say the quality is com very comparable, if not better, to the MakerBot. So $800 versus $2,800, it's a pretty good deal. And uh, what they have done was I approached them about libraries, and we explained what libraries are doing. And, how libraries are making 3D printers, and they're like, well, if that's the case, we should probably do less than $800 for libraries. And I was like, say what? And so that was a really cool conversation. So just by me approaching these people, we were able to make robo printer considerably less. Uh, I approached another 3D printing company who basically didn't, understand, didn't, didn't want to work with libraries. So there was, there was unsuccesses as well. I wouldn't say everything was successful. Uh, there, as a side note, Robo is also building something called makeable.com where you can showcase uh, and share your 3D print designs. So with all that being said, so the first reason why I went to CES was kind of promote libraries to different companies and show what libraries are doing. I did an online survey, um, really a really brief one, asking librarians, what great things have you done in your library? And then I used that when I talked to these different companies, saying, hey, this library in this area has been doing this. And they're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. So these companies, that if we go back to that original chart showing of 3,000 exhibitors, um, understand that libraries are important, but only 1,700 actually have been in a library, I was able to bridge that gap and basically get everyone on board about what great things libraries are doing um, and get them wanting to help libraries, do beta tests in libraries, deliver products for free to libraries um, all by talking. So that was hugely successful. The second thing I wanted to do was discover what trends were out there. So here are some main trends. Um, home automation, or life automation, as I'm going to call it. Uh, wearable technologies, technologies that you can wear. Uh, Self-driving cars. Gaming, in general. And the current tech, like 3D printers, 4K, TVs, 3D TVs. Stuff that's already been out, but is still very promoted and considered new. Um, and a couple other cool little products. So home automation. LG did a uh, keynote, and I left the. This is LG's photo. And I left the link at the bottom if you're curious. Uh, you can basically text your fridge, text your dishwasher, saying, "Hey, uh, I'm going to be be late," or, "Hey, fridge, I want to make this tonight. Do I have Do I have uh, all the ingredients I need?" Or, "Hey, fridge, um, looking at the ingredients I have in my fridge, what can I make tonight? Give me an alert when the eggs are low, or I need to order new milk." Hey, clean my house. They have a little like Roomba vacuum cleaner. Um, you can send the text to that, and it'll actually clean your house for you. 
So this home automation thing by controlling your home from controlling your house while you're away from home is starting to pick up pretty quickly. Uh, Whirlpool also has an interactive cooktop that they were showing off, where it's a surface, and just by putting your hands on the surface, you can start interacting. You can put a pan down, and know that hey, this is a pan. I'm going to heat this specific spot up. You can social media tweet out what you're cooking. You can pull recipes from Pinterest or Twitter or Facebook all through a touch interface. And at the same time, this could then interact with your fridge or your stove, make sure, sure that the stove is turning on for baking the cake as you're almost done with the sauce or the frosting. The other side of the coin is home security, um, such as Canary, uh, which is in the top left, uh, Drop Cam, which is in the bottom left, or DoorBot, which is on the right. So essentially, these are all, they all have embedded cameras that can detect who's there, who's not there. The DoorBot, for instance, is really cool. Like if you, have, if you have small children and you realize that they're not home at 3, it'll send you an alert because it didn't see them come in. Or if your children are home at 3 and it knows you don't get home till 5, but someone's at the door at 4, it'll send you an alert. So it learns all these things about us and it collects this data and then relays that data to us. Uh, Nest in the top right is a temperature control unit. It learns when you're home, when you're not home, and what temperatures you like. Um, I was in a presentation with Dropcam, and apparently it's now the biggest inbound video service on the web. Uh, there's more data uploaded, uploaded to Dropcam than YouTube, which I thought was pretty surprising. Uh, Vestech is another one for home automation. You can have your coffee pot turn on when you wake up every day at 6 or 7 or wherever it may be, and your thermostat can automatically adjust accordingly. So basically, we're getting all these devices within our home, within our home environment that's learning what we do and collecting that data and managing it for us. Um, that's why I always called it life automation, because basically now you don't really need to turn anything on. If it, you, it, we'll get to a point where like your shower will warm up and start the hot water, and the lights in the bathroom turns on when it learns that you wake up every day at 6.35. So we're moving to that point where everything's seamlessly integrating. And then in terms of wearable technologies, I've seen everything from a technology called Voice, D-O-Y-C-E, which is in the top left, where you can give your dog a, it's almost like a Fitbit, but way cooler. Uh, it can measure heart rate, uh, calories burned, those types of things. Uh, yep. then on the right is the Fitbit Force. Uh, it measures how your activity, you know, how many steps have you walked. And then they're even making activity monitors for children. At the bottom, at the bottom they're called uh, iBITS, I-B-I-T-Z. And so what they do is you can actually give your child reward points based off of how much activity they've done in the day. So, for instance, if they, they have this integrated with uh, Minecraft, which apparently is really big. I didn't know that. And after a certain amount of time, they can actually buy things from Minecraft based off the activity they've done. Um, here's the Fitbit exhibit booth. They actually had uh, people running treadmills and showing off the Fitbit, but I felt a little creepy taking a photo of them, so I skipped that part. Um, they had uh, technology that you can wear over your eyes, like Google Glass, that can interact very similar to Google Glass. And they had things all the way down to where your feet are that can detect if you're walking correctly, if your posture's right. Um, those types of things. And they even had stuff for, for babies. Uh, they had like a little binky thing that can detect how your baby's sleeping, their heart rate, etc. And then you can even life log your life. Um, we've all heard of Autograph or probably or Mamito, which is now called Narrative. Uh, life Logger is another one that you can wear and it takes pictures of everything you do as you do it. So again, we're collecting all this data about everything around us and everything we do, either to automate things or to share our lives with others. Uh, EDU Lock was another cool, cool gaming app that you have to answer math problems in order to unlock the tablet, and then after you or read, it, or they give you like a paragraph to read. After you read it, you can unlock your tablet and go on the internet for X amount of time. People are building playscapes that are digital. So this is a place, playscape called Neos, and basically you can play like there's like a firefighting game. So if you hit the firefighter, which is the little orange icon on the right there, these things light up. And when they're red, that means they're on fire, and you gotta cap it to 
basically turn it off. Uh, here's a robotics group. It's very similar to Lego, but uh, a lot cheaper. So they're called VEX, V-E-X, IQ. So if you go to VEXIQ.com, you can kind of see what they do. And they build uh, very similar to what Lego Mindstorms are, where you can program it and send data and have it pick up a ball and move the ball to point A to point B. You can also build it to remote control. So it actually has an extra feature um, for a lot less. And then from a programming perspective, I saw a lot of companies talking about how they're able to build really easy to use programs. And you can either, for their products, so if you wanted to change the product a little bit differently to suit your needs, they built interfaces that you can do it. Which if you take a step back, you might want to consider doing more programming within your library as well. Because um, it seems like a lot of companies want people to program their own devices to make it unique and make it specific to their own. So Hopscotch is a really cool one that lets kids build uh, iPad app apps using uh, object-oriented programming. So you drag commands over. So like there's like a sound picture. So if it hears a sound, what do you want it to do? And you drag these series of events over. Another really cool technology that I saw was the eye tracker, where you can't control your phone just by looking at it. So as you basically whatever you're staring at is where the mouse appears. Um, I had a terrible headache trying to use it because I think it was trying too hard, but some people were you know opening up programs and Google searching just by shifting their eyes all over the place. Their demo that they were showing was Fruit Ninja. So by looking where you want to slice the fruit, you can slice the fruit. Um, and then a whole bunch of uh, companies were talking about their self-driving cars. Audi had their self-driving car there. Google had their self-driving car there. Um, but if you think about it, there's really nothing special about the self-driving car. It's just a whole bunch of sensors that are interacting differently and relaying that information to you. So we basically could have built a self-driving car years ago because we've had all these sensors, cameras, depth perception, uh, temperature, heat, etc. And then the overly popular TVs. So they had curved TVs. If you ever wanted to have a curved TV, I don't see the need for one, but that was a huge hit. This was really cool. This was LG's display. It was all 3D, and it was ginormous. And basically, you, they give everyone 3D glasses, and you can see everything pop up at you. Uh, what was really cool, so if you were standing on the far left, whatever was popping out on the far left would be dead in your face, but if you moved to the far right, it would actually be off to your left. Like It wouldn't be directly in front of you like most 3D TVs are. Everything is perceived the same no matter where you're at. Whereas this is perceived differently depending on where you're standing. And then uh, more TVs and 3D printers were there. Uh, this was Prime Labs 3D printer, one of the most accurate and high definition uh, quality wise 3D printers on the market. And then a couple more 3D, TV, 3D TVs. And then some more cool technology. This was uh, this is blasting air in the air and a uh, projector screen facing it and you can actually interact without having an actual screen. So by moving his hand in front of where the air was, he was able to interact and also play Fruit Ninja. And then a lot of people are doing the whole iLock for authentication. You know, people can't remember passwords anymore. So we have too many passwords for too many things because we have a thousand devices now that are storing our lives, so we need a better password system. So I lock, you basically look at it, and it, and it unlocks, and then it works. And then other companies were showing off displays. So this is a tablet that you plug in, and it projects it in a large format screen TV. Very simple ideas. If you wanted to, if you ever were in a hotel, like one of those fancy ones where they had a little touch screen kiosk about what's going on, you can actually do that relatively cheaply now just by getting an Android tablet pointing it to a website, and then getting this device. And then Versal was another cool company that without doing any special coding, you can build an interactive course. So libraries that are doing those how to do this or how to build, how to play piano from how to cook, you can actually build an interactive course and allow your patrons to log in. More cool technology. Uh, Muse, which is a brain sensing, brain sensing headband, so very similar to what like a heart rate monitor does, what Muse can do is it detects your what is that EKG, your brain waves. 
And so it gives you exercises to do to help you relax and concentrate throughout the day. So I don't know if you actually want to wear this. I don't know. It looks fashionable, so it's perceivably okay. Um, but all this really cool stuff. And then what else was at CES? Tons of giveaways from $100 headphones to phone cases. I have so many phone cases now, like I don't even, I don't even want a phone anymore. Um, there's lots of companies with audio equipment, uh, such as, you know, the headphone speakers, etc. And then even tons more phone case companies. Don't know why there were so many. Um, there's also quite a surprisingly a large amount of OEM manufacturers, which, um, for instance, on the right here, that looks very similar to a Microsoft Surface, but it's not. They called it like their tablet, their Windows tablet. So it literally does everything that Microsoft Surface does, has all the exact same features of Microsoft Surface. It doesn't have the word Surface on it. It's just, it's just a blank. And it's like $200 versus uh, whatever Surface is costing with the keyboard. Oops. So, and then I attended a few different events. Uh, one event was really fun called Kids at Play, where it was um, presentation after presentation or panelists talking about technology for kids. Um, since I do a lot of that as it is, I thought it would be smart of me to attend it. Um, so this is the CEO, of, former CEO of LeapFrog, talking about how to build teams together around your product. Um, and some, some takeaways from that. Uh, a lot of people again and again said there's really nothing new or shocking at CES. It's a, nothing wow factoring. Um, like, oh my gosh, shoot me now, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, but most of the stuff they, they were showing at CES is actually just a, a different arrangement of sensors and how those sensors communicate. Uh, another really startling fact that a lot of people mentioned was merging digital and physical together. Uh, probably you know, last year or two years ago, a lot of people were trending in the direction of converting your physical products into pure digital products. Um, but now they're kind of complementing each other, as seen from the Neos little playground, interactive playground, where Furby actually has an app that talks to your Furby. So you're blending both physical and digital together. So not separating them completely, you're blending. Um, people were talking about how the play experience has changed. There used to be a lot of very gender-specific or age-specific games, and that's kind of going away. Uh, a lot of the companies that were showing off their tech was like, it's for all ages, from a little kid to a college kid for all ages. Gender doesn't matter. They're doing gender, gender neutral colors. Um, the CEO of LeapFrog gave a quote that I thought was really interesting um, where he said, none of us is as smart as all of us, uh, meaning we have to group together and come up with new ideas and concepts. One person can't have all the ideas and one person can't come up with that, the ideas without getting together. Um, another guy mentioned that augmented reality doesn't need to be in a virtual environment. Uh, so this guy, he built a, a headset that can read for you. So if you're visually impaired, you can put this headset on and look at words, and it will actually read those words to you. So he had a really cool video, and I was trying to find it, but I couldn't. Uh, essentially, of a kid that has never been able to read before, reading a Harry Potter book. And as they're interviewing him, his mom, they, his mom was trying to talk to her son. So when he looked up, he answered the question, but now he lost his place, right? Like if you're reading. So when he looked down, he goes, thanks, mom. You made me lose my space. You know, that's an experience that he would have never been able to have losing his space while reading. So I thought that was really cool. And then they all laughed because I was the librarian in the group, and I respected that joke. I respected that, that, um, that event. So and the other thing that was mentioned was that uh, we're no longer in a maker movement. People were always talking about, how oh, we're in a maker movement, et cetera. Uh, but it's more of a revolution now because basically everyone's revolting and wanting to build their own products. People want to make what they need. Make what they need. So if I want uh, an automatic, automatic toaster, People are just doing it on their own now. Um, and then somebody also was talking about um, children and how their security is going to change in terms of uh, their identity. And one, uh, I think Randy Zuckerberg mentioned that, that children have a digital identity before they're even born now. And uh, I was kind of surprised, but if you think about it, when you're, when you're pregnant and you take photos of the, uh, the sonograms or whatever they're called, uh, and you post those on Facebook. So basically they have that digital identity now before they're even born. And so she was, she was taking the standpoint of uh, to embrace it but take, but take control over it, which I thought was a really good point.
Uh, and then the other event um, it was an invite only, but I was lucky enough to get invited. Called it was the fashion wear, the technology fashion show. So all these wearable technologies, there was tons of different different designs and different people wearing different gear. Everything from performance monitors to heart rate monitors to headphones. Uh, the picture here, if you look on the bottom left of her, was a color changing uh, dress. And so, so a few other takeaways. There's clothes now that can vibrate for direction. So if you're in a city and you're trying to navigate around, you don't want to be looking at your phone. There's an app that can sync with your jacket you're wearing, and it will vibra vibrate the left shoulder when it's time to turn left, or vibrate the right shoulder when it's time to turn right. There's clothes that light up based on mood or sound. Um, so if it hears noises, it changes colors, or if you're happy or you're sad, it'll change colors. And a ton of performance monitors. So for next year, um, this being my first year I went, I definitely want to kind of restructure and do it differently. Um, take a lot more photos. I was, again, I mentioned at the very beginning that I kind of got like sidetracked and was just too mind blown by everything going on. So the camera went down and I would just like, ooh, it's an ahs as I like hit each booth. Um, definitely want to try to arrive earlier and attend the press events because there's a lot of really cool opportunities involved there. And there's also a ton of evening events and parties that I plan for the day of. And uh, looking back at that, there's, they post stuff online. And just if you're planning on going, make sure you review all those and really do put a schedule together. Um, and do a lot more networking. A lot of the events that I went to, like the invite only events or the, even the Venetian, I would have not have even been able to go to if I didn't just randomly chat with people. So I talked to one guy that's been there for 20 years, or has been attending for 20 years. And he's like, oh, hey, I've checked out the Venetian, then this is perfect for you. Or, and so those are very important. You have to be very social when you're at CES. Otherwise, it's not going to work out. And as a side note, I'm also trying So at the very beginning, I mentioned that I'm trying to change who's invited to CES. So while I was there, I was constantly asking, constantly tweeting about libraries and CES or libraries and technology. And actually, one guy approached me who I didn't know who he was, but he must have recognized me on Twitter. And he goes, are you the library guy? And I was like, yes, I guess so. And he's like, hey, I saw your tweets. Let's, let's chat about how we can get more involved with libraries and CES. So I thought it was really, really cool. And I'm hoping that we can start building um, an ecosystem within CES where librarians as a whole can go up to these different companies. And instead of just me, it would be better if there was you know, 20, 30, 100 of us talking to all these companies and giving libraries a presence in technology. Because we're using it. We're embracing it. We should be more closely partnered. So that's my, that's my wrap. Any questions? I know I threw a lot of stuff at, at you guys. I, thanks, Brian. That was wonderful. Um, just to respond to a few of the comments that, that are coming in, as usual, we are working to, to bookmark all of these things, and we'll put them in the show notes, and we'll get links from Brian, and Krista's mm -hmm. been frantically typing and finding URLs a, as we go along here. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of specific questions, but Krista, you did get one comment about yeah, the fridge. Well, we got some questions and things, um, yeah. Uh, um, talking about the fridge that can tell you things. Uh, someone wants yeah. to know, will it be able to just recommend ordering Chinese? Because that's what they really want. <laughs> That's a good question. I, don't, I honestly don't know, um, but they say they say that your your whole it probably could. I don't see why not. You know, if it doesn't have the ingredients for you, you can probably say, "Would you like to order out? Yeah. Where would you like to order from?" That um, could be an so option, would, absolutely. And then we did one question. Um, like you said, you were rattling off a whole bunch of different things, and they want to know the name of the company with the infrared music maker. Yes, that is called Beans B E A. M Z. If you go to the beans, I can type it in. The beans dot com. Great. Sounds like we've got at least one musician in the audience. So. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll, let me ask you a two-part question to kind of keep it really general here. What was the coolest thing you found while you were there, and what was the weirdest thing you found while you were there? Um, the coolest, uh, it actually might be the both. So I thought the eye tracker was the coolest, because like, I can control my phone by looking at my eyes, or, or using my eyes. But at the same time, it was also really weird, because like, I had a terrible headache trying to make my eyes, all right, look at the left icon, all right. 
Like it was a, I don't know, it, it took like a, it took like a, it took a whole effort to do it. Um, but I thought it was really cool. What else was I thought was cool? Um, I don't know, I thought all of it was really cool, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. um, I was like a little kid at a candy store. I wanted to, I wanted to touch everything, wanted to see everything. Um, No, yeah, I would have the uh, the other cool thing which I could never afford was the displayer, that little interactive screen with the. I thought that was really cool, as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, for the weirdest, I was. Yeah, I, I'm not sure on that one. Okay. Yeah, just sometimes there are these weird little gizmos floating around mm -hmm. out there, uh, but okay, that's cool. You know what? No, they had a uh, a shopping cart. I took a video of it with a like a face on it. And you could talk to it and it, like, follows you around. That was really weird. I was a little creeped out. I thought if somebody was actually controlling it. Huh. But they're like, no, it's artificial intelligence, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, no, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's too smart. Was, mm -hmm. wasn't, wasn't there a movie where, where, like, somebody's luggage got lost and the luggage was saying, hey, have you seen so-and-so? I'm his luggage. There, there was a movie that did that. Anyways, I'll, I'll think of it eventually. Uh, we had some other audience questions? Yeah, um, someone else wants to, didn't catch the name of the um, the company that makes the 3D printer that was less than $800. Um, yeah, I actually did not talk to them. but ah. So Robo is 800 but they'll give a discount. That's Robo 3D. The other one, let me go back on my slides. So I actually didn't chat with them. I just took a picture. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Well, any company that's going to say, hey, we should give a discount to libraries this should be should be worth uh, talking to. <laughs> that was the robo. They actually, they actually donated one to some high school group that was doing a robotics competition. They just gave it to them. They're yeah. like, here you go. That was awesome. No one asked us for a 3D printer, so here, you can just have it. <laughs> wow. Cool. Okay. And then um, the navigation jacket, they want to know, does it work while you're driving as well as walking? Um, let me see. I have the pamphlet on it. Let me look at it. I would I would assume it would work the same way. Theoretically, but it, yeah. But it might. Space. You might not like if you need to make a right while you're cruising like 25 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. Might not, you know, vibrate quick enough. Yeah, it might. If you could maybe adjust the lead time, mm -hmm. you know, because if you're walking, you don't need as much, uh, you know, lead time yeah, to, so to know you're going to turn. The jacket is called the Navigate jacket from. We colon ex. Cool. And I have all these videos. I took an entire video. I don't know if I was allowed to. I just did it. Um, I took an entire video of the fashion show with each uh, each model wearing the gear and as they talked about it. So I'll make sure that uh, Michael posts that as well. The uh, the video links. Okay. Great. And we do have um, one. Um, what technology did you think was the most relevant or promising for use in libraries, particularly for programming? Um, hopscotch. Yep. We thought, yep. For in terms of programming as development code or programming as in like a event. I'm assuming events. Uh, okay, so for events. Oh, actually, for an event, yeah, for events like programming in like programs in the library. All the robotic stuff I thought was really cool, which includes the the moss at, at uh, Madro Robotics, uh, the the Vex IQ, uh, the little like Lego robotics kits, mm -hmm. and then even basically sitting people down and having them build robots essentially makes a really cool program, and you can do the whole STEM learning. Um, and Curio, I, I've always loved Curio. They do uh, tablets, so you can actually do group games and stuff and play together and synchronize for gaming. Cool. Um, so, so let me ask you this kind of in the larger scheme of, of, of representing libraries to, to, um, to the companies. Um, at, at one point, you kind of said sometimes it was a little more successful talking to them. Sometimes it was a little less successful. I, I don't want you to necessarily name any names, but but... Was there any situation where you just got not a really great reaction from from a company or about a product, and they just it it what what would have been one of those unsuccessful situations? So um, while I was talking to three D while I was talking to three D company, so most of them were like, yeah, you know, we do have some of our printers in libraries, um, and then I got to one who was like, I don't see why libraries would want to use a stereo. What do you, you call it? A stereographic printer. 
which is the fancy name for a 3D printer. Um, and I said, well, they're doing, you know, libraries want to do beta environments. They want to let people build prototypes, whereas other libraries want kids to be able to build 3D modeling, op 3D objects, model them, and print them. And others just want to be able to kind of show it off. And then he's like, well, ours isn't for show off. Ours is quality. And I said, well, that's cool. So that means if a, uh, if a guy wants to build a startup company, but he has to build his prototype object first, and he does it at the library, and he's able to get funded, he's able to get successfully funded either through a campaign or through a venture capitalist, he's going to look back at that library that gave him that 3D printer to build that really nice 3D object. And the guy's, guy was just like, no, nah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I was like, all right, man. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> well, you, you tried. You, you, you gave it. You gave the effort. So, well, that's great. Um, and some that I didn't think that could even work in libraries, like track me down. Um, I don't want to mention names in case you're watching, right? But uh, this one company makes like a desk organizer, and it's a really cool idea. I just don't think it would work for a library space. Sure. But uh, you can basically plug everything in and it communicates. Huh. Interesting. Huh. Um, other questions from the audience at this point? No, just people saying this is so cool and I definitely want to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's I I I remember going to these and yeah, I, I will completely second the wear good shoes. Uh, um, yeah, I did not expect that. My shoes were ruined. I had to go buy new shoes and everything. Oh really? Like the treads and <laughs> Yeah, nothing is small in Vegas. That, that's for darn sure. Um, I noticed, too, you did your own personal step counting, and, and then you, you mentioned a lot of the, the wearables and um, kind of tracking ourselves. And, and uh, just uh, our plan for the February Tech Talk is I'm going to have Gary Wolf from a website called The Quantified Self uh, on and talking about kind of just that category of things going on and, and wearable computing and tracking your steps and your heart rate and when you got up and how well you slept and when you mm -hmm. showed up in the morning and when you left in the afternoon and things like that. So that that's definitely a pretty big category going on right now. Um, there was, there mm -hmm. was at least, whew, I, mean, I, was, I want to say like 10, 15 wearable like performance monitors. Everything from things that you can wear like as a shirt that monitors your heart rate to wristbands um, and even shoes. So yeah, the wearable health and fitness thing is, is skyrocketing. I'm still a little creeped out by it. I don't know if I want people knowing how much I walked. Uh, but oh, some people think it's cool. Well, I'm, I'm a Fitbit wearer, and I've got to tell you, lately I've been uh, um, trying to up my step count, and I've had a couple of friends in, in kind of the Fitbit ecosystem in, encouraging me, and we're trying to see who gets the most steps out of a week. And I've got to tell you, at least for me, it's, it's working a little bit. So... Uh, yeah, so pull that stuff my keeps on reminding me I have to walk more, and then it just <laughs> makes me sad. I'm like, and then when I when I was at Vegas, it was like, congratulations, you finally beat your record. And I was like, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. Um, so let's let's just back off completely here, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up uh, for the hour. And and if anybody else listening has more questions, you know, we still got some time. Feel free to to send those in, or we can turn on your microphone. If you have a mic, just just tell Krista to do that for you. Um, just uh, take a minute or two. Tell us a little more about the Evolve project, what you're doing with that, and kind of what its goals are, and uh, how people might be able to get involved with that if they're interested. Yeah, so what I'm doing with the Evolve project, I've been classifying it as an open collaborative platform um, where I'm actually going out on my own and finding all these companies and working side by side with them uh, to basically change the way people see libraries. So I recently kind of redesigned how I wanted to work and organize things. So I have all these different partnerships, as I'm calling them, with all these different companies um, that have predefined uh, library rates that are that might even be cheaper than the educational discounts, um, and at the same time offer demos. So some companies, either I have a demo that I can ship out. Uh, Peachy Printer, for instance, is sending me 10 3D printers for me to share with other librarians. And so by doing that, I'm able to kind of push stuff out. So I'm almost like a uh, technology and library promoter. I'm doing both on both sides, um, which has been pretty successful so far. Um, but yeah, the idea is to change the way people see libraries by introducing innovative and interactive technologies. Uh, and then I've been recently working on specifically focusing on robotics and programming. 
So I actually just partnered up with a group called Bird Brain Technologies that lets you build your own robot robot through like a really small kit. And you can make it like dance and do lights. And I can send you guys links for that too. Great. And is there a uh, website we should go to if, if we're interested in finding out what's going on? Uh, EvolveProject.org. I try to do like a weekly blog post. Um, but I'm still catching up from CES. I have a stack of business cards still of people to follow up with. But uh, EvolveProject.org. Great. Uh, uh, any other questions from the audience at this point? No. Anybody have no. any questions? You can type them in. Um, we are getting close to the end of our hour here. We still have about eh, 10 minutes or so, considering from when we started. So if you have any questions, comments, or anything, um, I just didn't want to say, um, Brian, you were mentioning wanting to get more um, librarians Libraries involved, involved. And going and, and whatnot. And I know, um, I don't know if you hooked up with um, Jason Griffey while you were there. He's the head of, I mean, you know Jason, but people don't yes. know. He's the head of library IT at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And I, I've seen him, his, oh, I tried to look and see how long he's been going. As far, I could see him as far, been going about it, as far back as like 2010 or so. Yeah, he's been going every year um, for a while now. Um, yeah, but so I didn't know I'm if you to... got with him or not. No, I did not. Um, we chatted briefly. He gave me a few pointers and stuff. Cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he does, he covers it with the American Library Association. So he also right. did a uh, live webinar, I think, last week mm -hmm. about it. But um, so what I'm trying to do with, with libraries and CES is actually get librarians to attend and also present um, yeah. about what they're doing in spaces regarding interactive technology. Um, so if I'm lucky or successful, I should probably say lucky, um, I might be able to get like a whole panel together of people, and that could be basically tickets in for different librarians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and get some of those vendors who think that their work, their products are not useful to libraries to realize they are, but getting them, getting get them up there as actual presentations. Yeah, mm -hmm. just like getting librarians now into South by Southwest. That we wormed our way into that too. <laughs> We're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, Which is awesome. That's exciting. Yeah. Oh, someone does want to know if you can go to the slide with your contact info. They want to, because I think you had uh -huh. something there about if, you, if they were interested, people are interested about attending again or in the future. There we go. And then a question of how can I find out what I can borrow from the Evolve project? I assume that would just be contact you or? Yep, just contact me, and uh, I'll either coordinate with the specific uh, company mm -hmm. or see if we can work something out and send something to you. Yeah, because it's evolveproject.org, right? Correct. Or, yeah, and it's also going to be in the show links. I've already put it in there as, in our links as well if people want to be able to quickly um, jump to it afterwards as well. Um, and you were also talking about, and you, you were both talking about um, wearable technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just wanted to let you got you know, Brian and everyone online know that we I just added to the Encompass Live schedule while we were sitting here <laughs> um, a, on, on February 19th, uh, we'll have a session on Google Glass. Uh, Hastings, some people may know in Nebraska, they've seen the news stories. Hastings Public Library here in Nebraska has Google Glass. And uh, uh, Jake Rundle from the library is going to be on with us on February 19th to talk about what they're doing with it and how they're using it and how they got a hold of it and all that. So if you're into that kind of thing, that might be some, a cool show to yeah. come watch. It. we got and some neat well. stuff coming yeah. up. That's, um, <laughs> Things are so, happening. <laughs> all right. Well, Brian, thank you very much. Uh, that was really wonderful, and, and I love getting uh, you know different perspectives on CES and, and people uh, looking at different things because it's one of those things you could send 100 people and everybody would come back with, I saw different stuff. It, oh, yeah. it, it, those things are just yeah. so huge. So I didn't even actually see everything. Like I kind of skipped the car section because, like, on Friday I was like barely able to stand. I was exhausted. <laughs> so kind of like looked at what else I wanted to see and kind of just, you know, pinpointed it. Right. But uh, yeah, I think if we bring an army of librarians, we'd be able to cover a lot more ground. Yeah, yeah. have a battle plan. <laughs> I'd love to go back. We'll see what happens. So, all right, Brian, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take control back here. And actually, I've got to be honest, um, I don't really have any news. Uh, I, I tried. I mean, really, when it comes to uh, January, um, the news is everything that comes out of CES. And so uh, we pretty much just uh, kind of had that covered. 
So, um, and there weren't any more significant security breaches uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, So uh, there's there's that. That are just commonplace now. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I I got my card replaced because of Target and whatnot. So, uh, but I believe I mentioned that last month. So, um, there you go. Uh, So uh, that's it for Tech Talk. And like I said, uh, we'll have the description hopefully very soon. For uh, Gary Wolf and the Quantified Self uh, next uh, February 26th, according to that. That's so, the last um, Wednesday in the month. Yes. That's the West Wednesday <laughs> in the month. And then I will mention on February 28th is uh, Big Talk from Small Libraries 2014. Uh, so uh, don't forget to register for that mm-hmm. also. And um, as we said, we have the links will be, you know, when the recording for this episode is in, the links will be there. And then, um, Brian, you send us, can you send us your slides? We can post them as well. Or if you put them uh, somewhere. I will like share them on... Yeah, yeah there's like 300 megabytes. Yeah, so or if you post I'll share it to you. Slide, slide share of your own or something, we can just link to that. We don't, we're not picky, whichever works. Okay, sounds good. Yep, all right, great. So that will be available right. afterwards. Um, so thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Brian. Um, and I hope you'll join us next week. Uh, as you see, here's our list of shows we have coming up. Um, the Google Glass one that I mentioned on February 19th, Michael's Tech Talk. February 26th, but next week our topic is music. Um, here in um, the Lincoln uh, City Libraries has a poly music library, and their music librarian is going to be with us next week to talk about what they've got there available, and um, she just recently attended the International Association of Music Libraries, which I think was somewhere in like Vienna, or uh, I can't remember. Oh. Anyway, it was something really cool. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> so Carol and Dow will be with us next week, so um, please do sign up and join us for that. Um, and if you are a Facebook user, we are on Facebook, so you can go to the Encompass Live um, Facebook page and like us there. You'll see notices of when our shows are starting, when recordings are available, um, reminders of what next week's show will be. Um, we do um, post, like here's the one for today. Uh, join us right now. People can pop in on the fly. As we had a whole bunch of people this morning, which is great. Oh, cool. um, so um, do like us on Facebook if you are a big Facebook user and um, follow us there. Other than that, that will, anything else? No, I'm all good. All good for this morning. All right, then. Thank you very much, and we'll see you uh, in the future on Encompass Live. Bye. Bye. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye.